Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. Now I hope that you did the problems for this section and basically it's really important that you had paused this video. Actually it's the next video now. So I hope that before you started this video that you did the best you can to solve as many of these problems as you can. Okay, so we're doing problems 13 through 22 and they're all about SN2 and different aspects and through this of course we're going to learn a lot. Now before we begin I'm going to show you a chart that we're eventually going to build our entire knowledge base around. This is a master chart that organizes SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. Okay, And we're going to build our story from this. So right now all we care about is SN2 but it's better just to show you the whole story and then you know don't worry too much about the rest of it but you're gonna see this organizes everything so it tells me let's review it real quick that if I'm dealing with an alkyl group that the alkyl group methyl is best remember this is the substrate the methyl is the most reactive secondary is the least reactive tertiary never happens remember vinyl let me point out what vinyl means because that's important Vinyl is a double bond carbon, an sp2 carbon. So if we have a Br, right there is the vinyl position. When you have a carbon that's double bonded or triple bond, the double bond is called a vinyl carbon, and they never react with SN2 ever, because it's it, the electron cloud is so big, the nucleophile can never get in. All right, so never tertiary and never vinyl. As far as the leaving group goes. Remember these three are the, you have to just remember the OTOS, OMS, OTF, those are the most important leaving group. They're the fastest to leave. Then you have your I, B, R, C, L, and F as we discussed in our theory video. All right, the nucleophile. Now, I wrote base because when we learn about E2, you're going to learn that it's a base, not a nucleophile in that role. But for now, let's look at the nucleophile. And what we know is that we need a good nucleophile. Why? because the rate of the reaction is dependent on that nucleophile, right? So we know that if you have a SN2, the rate is dependent on both the nucleophile and the substrate. So the better that nucleophile, the stronger it is, then the faster the reaction. Okay, now as far as the chart, I wrote C top right because it, this is coming from a bigger chart that I'm eventually going to give to you, but for now, you saw it in the video itself, that chart of the six rules to determine the strength of a nucleophile. Okay. Solvent, polar aprotic, right? So OH or NH, no good. You want things that have no OH or NH in it. It could have an O, could have an N, just not an H on them. Okay. Complete inversion. If you start with R, you get S. If you start with cis, you get trans. Complete inversion. These are the trends that we need to remember for the SN2 reaction. Okay, now let's use this in our problem solving. So the first one says draw the product of the following. Now notice that this carbon is chiral right there. And if that's chiral, then I must show inversion. I have to show that in this case, the N3 is going to come in from the back. So notice that I just have to switch. If the BR is on the wedge, the N3 is coming in from the back. That is inversion. Okay, you will never get the N3 on the wedge because that means it's retention, it's not inversion. And you only get inversion with SN2. Okay, now here, the same thing. This carbon right here is chiral in red. That carbon has a Cl, a methyl, and a whole big other side and an H. So you have to show inversion. So I draw out exactly what I see, but instead of a back for the O coming in, this OH group right here, that's the nucleophile, instead, I'm going to put it on the wedge, OH on the wedge. That is inversion, and that's the only product. Okay, here I have trans, right? This is a ring with an OTOS, OTS, and a methyl opposite of it. Well, at the end of this reaction, it will become cis. This is still back because we didn't do anything there, but we're going to make it cis now, right? This is back, and who's coming in? The sulfur. So back for SH. Now remember, just ignore metals. Metals are counter ions. You want to see who's touching it. Whoever's touching the metal is negative. That's all that you know. So sulfur is negative to begin because it has a metal touching it. Okay. This one's a trick. I want to make sure you see the trick. Now, this right here is cis. 
So you might say it's trans at the end, right? Because it's SN2. But it's actually not. Because think about it. The carbon that makes the ring cis is right there in yellow. That carbon is not being touched. This nucleophile is coming into this carbon over there. That's not the one that makes it cis. The ring carbon is what's cis, right? So it's still going to be wedge over here. That's still wedge. It's still going to be cis. But now you have a CN coming in. Now, this is still cis. So you know, see the trick? If I was to touch the carbon that makes the cis, the wedge bond, then it becomes trans. But if I'm not touching that carbon, then it's the same as it was to begin. Now, how do I show the, the, the CN? You might be tempted to draw it on the left side since the BR is on the right. See that? But it doesn't matter. Remember what I said? If the carbon is not chiral or it's not stereo in any way, cis-trans, if that carbon is not, then you could just draw it as you see it. So I can literally draw a CN right there, like this, CN triple bond N. And it's fine. You might say, well, why is it on the right side? Isn't that where the BR is leaving from? There is no right or left side. This is all on paper just for convenience. However, if there is no stereo, it doesn't matter. The stereo carbon is here in red and here in red, right? Those are the stereo carbons. The carbon that has the halogen is not on the stereo carbon. So it just doesn't matter. You just put it in, you're done. So this was a trick. I hope you see it. This is a very popular trick on an exam. Okay, so that was a trick. Let's do the next one. Now, is this stereo? This is not chiral, right? So I gave you wedges and dashes to make it look chiral, but it's not chiral. There's two H's down there. So it doesn't matter. I can draw it out where I have a O, and then the ethyl, so here's my piece that I'm connecting on. This O is coming in with the ethyl and taking the place of I. I'm pulling off the I, I'm putting in the O. We're doing an SN2, right? But it doesn't matter if it's pointing in the same direction as the I was. It don't make a difference because there is no stereo there. So I only showed you wedges and dashes to trick you, to make you think that it's stereo, but it really doesn't matter. It's the same. Okay, so it does do an inversion, but you don't show an inversion unless there's chirality because you don't really see it in real life. I'll, let me I'm going to make that clear. I want to make sure. But look at the other one, by the way. This carbon in green is stereo. It's got four unique groups. And so since I didn't touch that carbon, it should stay the same way. There's a wedge methyl and a back H that never changes. Right. So the green carbon is exactly the same. But the carbon that has my leaving group, my halogen, is in chiral so I could just draw it out so here's what I'm trying to say and then I'll go to the last one if I have something over here and this is let's say a wedge uh, let's say ethyl ET now when I react this with a nucleophile let's say CN minus the fact that this carbon is not chiral this is a chiral means it does go through inversion but you can't identify what that would actually look like because there's two H's. So it, 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 there's no way to show the inversion. So you, all, you simply have to just draw it out with the CN, and it doesn't matter if it's pointing in the same direction as the way the BR was. It doesn't mean that it came in on the same side as BR. All it means is that it, it might have came in opposite to when it attaches, but you could just rotate it around and it'll put it wherever you want. So that's why you don't have to show inversion. But when it's a chiral carbon, it's very important that you show inversion because you will never get one of the two forms. So if you have the end, like for the example A, if BR is on the wedge for A, then there's never going to be a case where the end comes in on the wedge ever. And you can't rotate it to make it look that way. Remember, configuration is important. When something's chiral, if you don't connect it the exact way it's supposed to be connected, you might make the wrong enantiomer. So that's why I had to show back opposite of where BR is, but only if there's stereoisomer. In this case, this is the stereocarbon right here in green, and I just left it the same because I didn't touch that carbon. If you don't touch it, it stays the same. And the carbon that does react all the way in on the right, the red carbon, that's not chiral, so it don't matter. We could draw it in the exact same location as the BR, and it's fine, okay?